there's a lot of interesting trials going on right now, which is which is good because um, obviously we need some some MoBeta treatments. Um, and we're opening a few of them now. Uh, a few of them are things that are done, but we're waiting for results. So I thought I'd just give you a quick update on that. These are my disclosures, none of which are relevant, I don't think, for anything I'm going to talk about. Um, we're kind of expanding the kinds of trials and the indications that, that are going on here. Um, so it's worth kind of mentioning that. <clears throat> the, the main active trial right now going on nationwide and that we're participating in, Dr. Monteith, contributed a patient who's just finishing her induction uh, this week uh, on this is ICT-107 is a dendritic cell vaccine. Um, it's, it's not tissue-based. Um, it's it's lab-based on common antigens expressed in GBM. Um, so it's kind of a little mixture cocktail of things that are likely to be found in the majority, but not all GBMs. Um, Patient-derived dendritic cells are used in the lab to stimulate them against these common antigens. Um, patients have to be HLA typed to the lab method, so not everyone is eligible, and not everyone's GBM is going to have uh, one or more of these antigens. Um, the trial, there, this theory has kind of expanded that, that for all the immunotherapies, all these trials exclude patients with residual tumor. Um, that's really just based on a theory that if there's bulky local immune suppression, these things won't work. There's no data really proving that, um, but that's how all the trials have been designed. So I think if any of these trials really do succeed, people will have to remember this big question is, if they succeed only in people who had minimal to no residual tumor, that is not the majority of our patients, and it never will be. So there will be a question about how can you broadly apply these in the real world. Um, so this is a phase three placebo-controlled uh, trial uh, of this injection process. It's, it's really hard to get into, so it'll raise questions if it succeeds about the, the generalizability of the results. Um, but patients with no or very minimal residual tumor um, and who have the proper HLA type, which is about 40 to 50 percent of people, um, hopefully our patient's tumor has several, if not at least one, of the antigens. The chances of that are about 70 to 80 percent that she'll have at least one of these. Um, and, and patients go through standard radiation and temidar, and then they start a series of inductions with, um, with the, the dendritic cell vaccine made with their own dendritic cells, um, and then continue with maintenance temidar and monthly maintenance uh, vaccination versus placebo. Uh, this trial, it's, it's really kind of a third of the way into its accrual. It's a big study, but it should give a definitive result one way or the other. Um, and, and we'll see how that goes. The other trial that we're enrolling patients in right now is nivolumab, which is one of the most commonly used checkpoint inhibitors right now. Um, it's been approved with positive studies in lung, lymphoma, uh, and, and renal cancer. Um, we're waiting for results on breast studies, um, and they're doing a, a large trial now for GBMs. So this is one of the inhibitors, the PD-1, PD-L1 pathway. Um, so it's kind of the, the canonical checkpoint inhibitor like most of them. Um, and I won't belabor the point because I think people are getting familiar with these drugs. The, the bottom line is when, when you do this, you kind of free up the immune system to be more responsive to any atypical cell. Um, there are significant side effects that people develop, usually kind of mild and tolerable rashes, joint pains, diarrhea, fever, headache, fatigue. Um, because it's the immune system, though, unlike a lot of other treatments, it's really unpredictable. People will have no side effect with one infusion and then have really significant side effects with the next, and every infusion is kind of its own its own story and treatment as the immune system changes. Uh, again, people really can't have, like, large, bulky residual tumors, again, based on that kind of unproven but widespread theory about local immune suppression from bulky tumor. Um, we know from the prior phase one and two studies that a significant number of people on these drugs will develop significant cerebral edema uh, around their tumor. Uh, that's part of why the bulky tumors have been excluded. Um, that's probably pretty common. Uh, you can address any of the side effects with high-dose pulse uh, solumedrol, but then there's the worry that you're then, you're then canceling out any beneficial immune uh, response that you've generated. So uh, one arm of this trial for unmethylated patients has completed accrual, uh, so we'll be following and waiting for results. The methylated GBMs, uh, that, that arm of the trial is still open and has quite a ways to go, so we're still enrolling, uh, but currently only methylated patients are, are eligible to be enrolled. Sure. Uh, patients on are they also concurrently on Yeah. Um, there used to be this, this theory, you know, that, that, oh, you know, if you give Temidar, you're suppressing the immune system. The effects of Temidar in the immune system are extremely mild and selective. It causes a selective CD4 lymphopenia. 
you know, often they're on steroids. That's why they get thrush, shingles, cold sores, and rarely PCP. You rarely see neutropenia. Um, I think the nice thing that, that, that the rindapepima that the Duke people showed was that, you know, when you, if you time these things right, when you have a, a, a CD4 lymphopenia, you're actually, your immune system is primed. So when you're giving vaccines, at least, you actually get a better and more selective response if you give it when the person has a mild CD4 lymphopenia, because um, they have more naive cells coming out, active, ready to be primed. Um, so you actually may be boosting immune responses uh, by giving with Temodar if you time it right. Um, whether that's true, the checkpoint inhibitors is a lot harder to say immunologically. What they're doing is very different. Um, but, but yeah, these are all given with concurrent Temodar. With the nivolumab study, you know, people have really moved that for the unmethylated tumors, there is significant benefit of adding Temodar. It's a lot lower, but it's there in the original Stoop study. Um, so, so in the nivolumab study, for the unmethylated patients, they don't, they don't, re they either receive Temodar or nivolumab. That's what they're randomized to, uh, which is a little bit interesting. Um, but it kind of, all these trials are kind of colliding with an evolving practice where some practitioners are not giving Temodar to the unmethylated patients, which I kind of disagree with because we have clear data that it has slight benefit, not as much as in the methylated. Um, but that's the trial design. So we just finished accrual um, nationwide for the VB111 study. This is a modified adenovirus uh, to express human uh, FAS. So it should induce apoptosis. Um, allegedly, it does it selectively within tumor vascular cells um, to induce apoptosis of the tumor vasculature. Um, the theory is that, that when that, that type of apoptosis is occurring with the adenovirus in the, the cell that you might be prompting uh, a secondary and long-lasting immune response. So this is for recurrent GBMs. We enrolled several patients in this trial, uh, and patients were randomized to bevacizumab, which is our current standard of care, quote-unquote, with or without um, infusions of this BB111 viral agent. Um, so that study has just completed accrual, and we'll be waiting for results. All of the BEV studies are hard. Uh, because outcomes with BEV are so variable. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how the data evolves and, and is mapped out. Um, you know, but the, the, the Duke study with the polio virus got a lot more attention, um, but this, this, this kind of viral approach actually had a lot more solid preliminary data, uh, certainly a lot more safety data and more kind of immunologic, biologic exploration of the potential mechanism than polio. Um, so this really is far ahead of the polio studies, um, despite the bigger press that a lot of that got. <clears throat> um, uh, there's Dr. Cobb's study that I think people are quite familiar with, uh, so I won't, I won't go into that too much, but still ongoing, collecting patients for tumor cells. We've started treating the first couple of patients um, with cocktails of drugs that have been screened against the patient-specific um, tumor cells. The other one that I'll mention so people are aware, I kind of belabored a lot, but any patient who's being screened for a potential GBM, um, there's a lab group at UAB uh, that has found that there's differential expression of cytochrome C oxidase within GBMs. There, the high or low expression does not seem to correlate with any other known marker of prognosis in GBM. It may correspond to, to kind of apoptosis metabolism link pathways. Um, cytochrome C is really what determines when, when a cell begins to undergo apoptosis, which pathway uh, and which form of apoptosis it'll, it'll undergo. Um, so it may be a critical pathway between cell metabolism leading to apoptosis, especially in these tumors that are highly necrotic and in hypoxic environments that change over time. So they want to they wanna validate their findings. So this is a tissue biomarker study. Uh, so if you have patients who have a possible GBM, we don't have to know it's a GBM, um, you let the study coordinator know. Uh, if the patient is agreeable, they would collect some fresh frozen tissue straight from the OR. Um, the only really requirement from the patient after that is that they plan on undergoing standard of care. If it turns out not to be a GBM, that's fine. We just cancel the collection and we don't send the tissue. Uh, if it is a GBM uh, and the patient does proceed with standard of care radiation and Temodar, uh, then we just follow their outcome because uh, they're trying to validate if the high or low expressors do have a different outcome than, than other patients or known markers. Um, this is kind of an important study, I think, for, for the department because our site in Swedish is the only, this NeuroNext network kind of plugs uh, the, the, the institutions that are members of it straight in to this NINDS network for phase two neurology study funding. It was very, very competitive for studies to, for centers to be part of it. Um, we're the only non-university center that was accepted. Uh, Henson really worked really hard to get that. 
um, the whole network has kind of had, had a slow start. Um, and a lot of us are surprised that they're doing any oncology related studies at all. Uh, so at least to me, I think it's really important that we continue to submit tissue and be a good a good member of the site, even though this may not be the most exciting treatment related study. Um, we, we submitted the first tissue they ever got, so they were happy about that. Um, and we're kind of in the lead in their accrual numbers, so I'd love to continue that and just keep submitting tissue. Uh, there's almost no reason that a patient would not be eligible unless they're like really elderly and sick and you think they're not going to do standard of care treatment. Um, and of course, if they're unwilling, but I've never had a patient say no when they're like, just get it out of me and do whatever you want with it afterwards. And of course, biopsies would not be eligible, but you really don't need a huge chunk of tissue for the study. Um, and Becky Wood is the main study coordinator. Nathan Hansen has been really, really helpful um, uh, in this too. So you can just call them. They pop down to the OR, take a little extra piece of tissue once Rostad's satisfied that he has enough, and, and then we can take over from there. So please remember that. Um, the other study that hopefully we'll be joining is an ECOG ACRIN study. It's an imaging biomarker study for recurrent GBM where they do, um, there's interesting data, you know, because the response to BEV is so variable. Uh, some patients do really, really well on it. Other patients, it seems to do absolutely nothing. Other patients, MRI looks great. Patient just seems to progress as if, as if nothing's being, being done for them. So there's some preliminary data that, that perfusion imaging, which we're doing anyways, may actually help predict that, but it depends critically on a pre and, a, and the timing of the post um, to be predictive. So this is going to be the study that, that addresses that. Um, so basically, the patient who's going to be going on a, a bevacizumab anyways, they get perfusion imaging immediately prior to their first dose and then immediately prior to their second dose. So it's a really early repeat perfusion MRI. Um, and I, I talked to Dan Santo about it. And the sequences they want are what we do anyways. Um, so this may be a really interesting study because it'd be great if we could know within two weeks, are you going to respond to this drug? Is it worth continuing it? And if you're not going to respond, forget it. Let's move on and do something different um, with, with really a simple imaging modality. So this may be a really great study uh, if it pans out. The other study that is almost done with accrual is, is kind of this horse that keeps being beaten in all of oncology of PARP inhibitors as potentiators of alkylating agents. Um, they're pretty well tolerated. The phase two study was, was somewhat encouraging. Um, so it's only for methylated patients, again, which is the smaller subset of people. Um, but it's adding this filiparib or ABT888 alongside radiation and standard of care temidar. Uh, in the lab, at least in an animal models, doing that seems to potentiate you get more cell kill. You also potentiate the side effects of your temozolomide in general, too. Um, so we know that it comes with a slightly increased uh, risk profile and side effect profile. Um, it's almost done with accrual. Other Providence Cancer Centers um, have, have contributed patients. Um, so pretty soon it should close and we'll be waiting for, for results. Um, but it might give our current treatment, you know, a, a little bit of a boost in its efficacy, which would be good. But again, it'd be only for the methylated patients, not for unmethylated, which is the harder, the harder one. We're waiting results for, for an mTOR study, um, a phase two study. We've been waiting for a while on this. Um, there's a lot of kind of, of pre-existing molecular data that across most GBMs adding these mTOR inhibitors might also have uh, effect as a radio sensitizer and maybe a chemo sensitizer. Uh, we know it gets into the brain. It's useful in tuberous sclerosis and SEGAs. That data is really convincing. Um, and it's reasonably tolerable. Um, so we're waiting for the phase two results to then proceed to a phase three. Um, and we'll see how encouraging they are and whether or not we would participate as a site. Um, uh, but that has been dragging its feet a little bit. The other study I'm interested in, we're going to open a, an ongoing alliance study for symptomatic treatment. As you guys all know, any patient who gets radiation, but especially the gliomas, they, they have significant fatigue that can last for years. Um, they have subcortical uh, cognitive problems. Uh, the Ridlin studies were really disappointing. There are some patients that really say they feel a lot better with Ridlin, but the studies say that's really not generally true. Um, there were some early studies of modafinil um, that were slightly encouraging, um, but they didn't proceed to, to anything to get an FDA approval. Uh, but, but my experience has been pretty positive with it. Um, so they're going to finally do a good, pos a good study with our modafinil, which is the next generation agent. Um, and, and, and so hopefully it will be a site for this study. It's a really easy one for patients. They can be within two years of finishing radiation. They do fatigue scales and a brief, you know, but, but good reproducible subcortical cognitive scan. 
um, take drug at one of two doses versus placebo for eight weeks and repeat their testing. Um, so I'm actually really enthusiastic about this just to make our patients feel better, improve their function and quality of life in a simple, safe, easy way if this pans out. Um, so we're doing some symptomatic treatments. There's a lot of other things going on at different centers, um, but none of that that we're planning on participating in in the near future that I'm aware of. Um, we are working on getting a couple other uh, immune therapies uh, open as recurrent and in the upfront setting uh, in combination with angiogenic agents. Um, we're also going to open a panel of studies for primary CNS lymphoma. You guys have a lot more CNS lymphoma than we should, uh, honestly, for the population size. You know, when I was at Memorial, it seemed like the whole world had primary CNS lymphoma, but they were drawing from an enormous, enormous uh, population size. Um, but you guys have a very steady click of new patients, and it's not a referral bias. The vast majority of patients we see are people who just walked into one of our ERs and live locally. So it's, I don't think it's a referral bias. Um, yes. It has to be a vitamin D thing. It has to be. <laughs> um, although, you know, the data says that the incidence of primary sinus lymphoma is increasing independent of HIV, independent of increased transplant. Um, and one of the theories about it is that is that later in life exposure to EBV may make people more prone um, to EBV-driven lymphomas, but the vast majority of these cases are not EBV-related anyways. So it's not clear what's going on, but we may be seeing an increased incidence. Um, we have fantastic partners now that Pagel and the transplant team are here to take care of them. Um, so we're going to be opening a few studies. One is of nivolumab, the same immune checkpoint inhibitor for refractory recurrent primary CNS lymphoma. Um, hopefully we can open. There are some funding issues, but uh, you know, patients who achieve a, a complete remission, they still have a pretty high relapse rate in the subsequent two years. Um, studies of rituximab as maintenance therapy were pretty disappointing, um, but there's a, kind of a fourth generation now CD20 antibody inhibitor called obinutuzumab that, that allegedly has better CNS penetration than the other ones. Um, so hope we will open that study as a maintenance treatment for people who achieve a complete remission. There are some neat studies going on of a brutinib, um, and Revlimid, and hopefully a next generation Revlimid called pomalidomide um, for refractory recurrent. People have been so enthusiastic about those that there's even talk of moving them into the upfront setting. Um, and then we're kind of waiting for results about transplant versus standard cytarabine atopicide for consolidation treatment. Um, and then probably the last one I'll talk about relevant to the other cases, as I said before, I've got nothing for you to help with meningioma except maybe, maybe Avastin for really like last ditch desperate uh, situations, uh, which I have seen work uh, or at least temporize things. So we have learned a lot more about different subtypes of meningiomas and their molecular alterations and growth pathways they use. Interestingly, a lot of those seem to correspond to the anatomic location of the meningioma, especially these skull base and olfactory groove meningiomas. Um, so they're doing kind of a dedicated match trial um, for meningiomas that's going on in open nationwide. We're this close to having the paperwork to open it as a site here. Um, so they, currently they have three arms. So basically you submit patients who, who have failed standard of care treatment. Um, it doesn't require that they've had radiation, but I'd be a little reluctant to enroll somebody who has not um, done that because it really is the current standard of care after people have failed surgery and radiation. Um, certainly those patients ha don't have a lot of options, um, and, and patients who clearly have evidence of growth and are willing, uh, you submit tissue. If they match for any one of the three current arms of the study uh, with an NF mutation, a smoothen mutation, an AKT mutation, um, then they automatically get access to the molecular inhibitor of that pathway, uh, all of which are pills, two of which are drugs that are already FDA approved and in use for other indications. Um, so they're kind of known quantities. One of them, it really is a phase one, you know, first in human study going on. So for the patients, it may really depend which arm they match to, and not all patients will match. Um, the NF mutations are the most common. Smoothened and AKT are, are almost only seen in these skull base, but those are often the patients like the one we were discussing that, that really are in trouble and, and are failing standard approaches. Um, so that study should be open extremely soon. I actually saw a patient yesterday who might be our first patient to enroll. But it'd be great if we had something for these people, because currently we have not many options. 
and I sh there's another study we're going to be opening for anaplastic astrocytomas, which we seldom get trials designed for, uh, of combining CCNU with a, a hormonal agent called eflornithine. So we got a lot of good stuff going on across kind of a broader spectrum. We're, we're working on getting some METS trials open, um, which has always mystified me. You know, we get 10 times as many METS um, as these primary tumors, but it's like pulling teeth to get funding or anyone interested in doing studies for them. Um, but the patients are doing better and better. So hopefully we'll get some, some MET studies uh, open and running too. Do you see kids at all? Maybe no. Under 18? No. <laughs> I mean, unofficially, I was just talking to one of the peds onks from, from Children's about this yesterday. Um, I think it would depend on the situation. And, and what we talk about with them is, you know, when we have young adults with a pediatric tumor, you know, I'm happy to hand them over to those people. There, there's a, a medulloblastoma expert at Seattle Children's. He's a world-class expert. You know, I think a, 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 a patient who's over 18 with a medulloblastoma is honestly better served in, in his hands than mine. Um, but if somebody, you know, is 16, 17, you know, to me, if, if they can breathe, they're an adult biologically. Um, <laughs> the, the, the obstacle would come if, the, if this, if, and it, it depends to what it is. If it's a meningioma or something like that where I'm really just be playing neurologist for them, um, that's one situation. The obstacle we could come up with is if it's something where they're going to need chemo, then there are some administrative obstacles. Um, you know, for me, writing chemotherapy, you know, I, I don't have an inpatient service. Um, and then, you know, I have to be respectful of the nurses. Um, you know, someone who's not a certified pedonc nurse, they're, that's taking on a lot of liability for them uh, beyond me. So it kind of depends what, what they need. Um, and fortunately, we do have great, you know, pedonc people to refer to for most indications uh, for patients who do need that. And they have some great trials going on. They have seemed really open in discussions because the other, there's all these crossover things. So like for medulloblastomas, um, there's a lot of interesting trials going on based on the different molecular subtypes now, um, a couple of which they have open. They're going to be opening a broader spectrum apparently in the near future. These not that rare H3 mutant gliomas, um, they kind of smear across children and young adults too. We had one case recently. Um, hopefully there will be some great trials for that. Um, so, so it kind of would be a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you.